When Saint Celestine arrived in Naples, he was lodged in the Castel Nuevo in one of its great halls. The Pope ordered a wooden hut to be constructed and decided to remain in it alone, as he had done in the past. But however he might wish to be alone, he was not hidden because, like the ostrich, he had only buried his head in the sand. King Charles could still get at him and persuade him to do as he wanted. However, Celestine did not contrive to remain at peace in his cell and to find time to think over the many situations in the church. In the retirement of his cell, Celestine began to realize that he could not defend himself. He could not understand the language of those around him, even less the questions of law and politics that were brought before him. He began to wonder if there was a way he could step down from the burden that he was bearing without danger to his soul. Among the very few books that he had ever in possession was a little compendium of canon law. After consulting this, Celestine came to the conclusion that if, for good reasons, other clerics could lay down their office, so too could a pope. However, having no superior into whose hands he could resign his office, he was not quite sure. He then asked a friend who did agree that a pope could resign for a suitable cause, and was of opinion that to resume one's former mode of life was reason enough. For greater security, he consulted a second friend, who confirmed the first, and thus Celestine made up his mind. He would resign. With this mind now made up, Celestine consulted some cardinals regarding his resignation. Of these was one naturally Cardinal Benedict Gattiani, who was acknowledged generally to be the most learned of his brethren, and who, even by Celestine's disciples, is called the wisest and most upright cardinal of his time. Benedict assured him that it was permissible, and even adduced instances of some popes who had already done so. He gave him the only answer that reason and common sense, informed by the records of history, could have given. If, however, Cardinal Benedict correctly assured the Pope that he could resign, he urged him not to do so, protesting that his sanctity would suffice to instruct and enlighten the sacred college. Word of Celestine's intention to resign spread. When his monks found out, they tried earnestly to divert him from his purpose, his rustic crowd implored him not to abandon them, his untutored flock. They feared being classed as heretics by some of the cardinals. The monks stirred up the people of Naples, and by command of the king, a great procession in which were to be seen many bishops of the neighborhood, with all the religious and priests, made its way from the cathedral to the Castile Nuevo. Arrived at the Castile, appeal was made by it in the usual way for the Pope's blessing, Showing himself with three bishops at one of the windows, Celestine duly blessed the assembled multitude. He then listened to an address from one of the bishops of the procession, who in a voice so trumpet-like that it was heard by all the people in the square, begged the Pope in the name of king, priests, and people not to consent to resign as he was the glory of their kingdom. To this, one of his attendant bishops gave, in the Pope's name, an ambiguous answer. Supposing that his petition had been granted, the king's orator intoned the Te Deum, which was taken up by the whole procession. This took place about the feast of Saint Nicholas. As a result of the agitation of the Pope's monks, a disorderly mob had broken into the Castile and made the same request was afterwards made in form by the organized body of clerics of the city. Celestine summoned the whole body of the cardinals a day or two after the dismissal of the mob. When he had put before them his previous mode of life, he asked them whether old age, formed habits, ignorance of Latin or of Polish speech, limited intelligence, experience, and training were not reasons enough to justify his resignation. Though the cardinals could not but agree that the reasons adduced were sufficient to justify resignation, they urged him to test his powers and to remain in office for a time longer, and meanwhile, refraining from following bad advice, to pray himself and order prayers to ascertain the will of God for the good of the world. Public prayers were accordingly ordered, and for some eight days Celestine so acted as to allay all suspicion that he still entertained any idea of resigning. 
Meanwhile, however, with the aid of Cardinal Giattiani, he drew up a deed of renunciation. The cardinals were ordered to meet the Pope on the Feast of St. Lucy, December 13th. Swinging open the very door, which still gives interest into this magnificent apartment, they found the Pope seated on his throne in full pontificals. When he had signified that he did not wish any interruption, Celestine suddenly produced the deed of renunciation which, with pale face, he read out clearly to the assembled fathers. He told them that, of his own accord and free will, he resigned the papacy, as his age and other defects rendered him incapable of fulfilling its duties, and he wished to put an end to further disasters and to attend to his soul's salvation. He then exhorted the cardinals to show their care for the world by electing a worthy pastor who would lead the flock to pastures abundant and fresh, and who would correct the many mistakes he had made. Then to the profound astonishment of the cardinals in front of him, straightway descending from the throne, he took off, one after another, the insignia of the papacy, his mitre with its crown, the red mantle, the ring, and the other pontifical, even to the alb. All this he did with every sign of joy. If he took the chair of Peter with sorrow, he left it with gladness. He then withdrew and returned wearing the simple garb of his order, and taking the lowest step on the throne, said, Behold, my brethren, I have resigned the honor of the papacy, and now I implore you, by the blood of Jesus and his holy mother, quickly to provide for the church a man who will be useful for it, for the whole human race, and for the Holy Land. When he had said this, he rose to go, but the cardinals who had not been able with dry eyes to look at the scene so touching in its simple humility, entreated him not to leave them until he had duly provided for the future. To put the situation in order, it would be well if he would decree that a pope could resign and that the cardinals could accept such a resignation. A decree to that effect was accordingly at once drawn up and signed, and afterwards inserted by Boniface in his Liber Sextus of Canon Law. Celestine's best deed was his self-sacrificing acceptance of the papacy, thereby putting an end to its disastrous vacancy, and his second best act was his humble resignation of it, whereby he saved himself from inflicting irreparable harm on it and the church.